Paul Rosen from JPL is joining us at the 10th SPI Asia Pacific Remote Sensing Symposium here in New Delhi today. Paul, what brings you to the symposium? Well, we had a special session on the NASA ISRO SAR mission and uh, there were nine papers. I was the chair of one of the sessions and gave the first talk. So tell me, what is NISAR all about? Uh, NISAR is a dual frequency L-band and S-band synthetic aperture radar mission that will map the Earth every 12 days from two directions such that we get effectively one week sampling of the Earth, all the land and all of the ice surfaces to measure its changes over time. I believe that you're using SweepSAR technique in this technology in this. Is this the first time that SweepSAR is being used? SweepSAR was effectively invented for this mission. It is needed in order to get the coverage and the sampling at the rates that we need it to make the science measurements that we want to make, yes. So you mentioned that it's a dual band mission. How do you plan to synchronize those two bands? ISRO is building the S-band system and NASA is building the L-band system. The way we're synchronizing it is through a clock, basically a timing signal that comes from the L-band system and is sent directly to the S-band system. And in order for uh, the S-band system to synchronize, it needs to read that clock and make sure that it turns on its radar precisely to within a fraction of a very small fraction of a second when the L-band system turns on so that they are working together. They don't, uh, they don't have conflicting measurements. So what are the range of applications that the satellite would be used for? Oh, it's very, very broad. The primary science objectives are uh, cryosphere, studying the ice sheets and how they move and sea ice. Uh, that's related to climate and its variability. Looking at carbon and its change through looking at the forests, uh, looking at deforestation and things like that. And then looking at solid earth and natural hazards, earthquakes, volcanoes. Those are the primary science objectives, but the applications are very, very broad, from agriculture to disaster response to coastal processes to ocean winds. It's just almost anything that you can use uh, fast time series with radar, uh, this has applicability for. How do you plan to reach out to the user community? The user community in the United States is, uh, is, is reached through workshops, typically. We have a science workshop and an applications workshop every year. And we also have a science team that is selected by NASA to guide the science and the applications of the mission. So through those two mechanisms, we can reach the community. We also, of course, present papers at conferences. We have special sessions. We have things called um, town hall meetings at some of the major conferences. American Geophysical Union, for instance, is one in the United States that we, uh, we attend every year and uh, other mechanisms like that. So one part of the satellite is being manufactured in India, the other in the US. How are you collaborating? How, how difficult is it to communicate? It is a challenge because primarily the time difference and the different ways in which we manage our projects. Uh, the way we do it is through a continuous series of teleconferences and meetings. We have uh, quite literally one teleconference every night of the work week uh, night for us, morning for ISRO, uh, and uh, we have meetings such as uh, this last week we had a meeting in uh, ISRO SAC uh, for, we have them probably four or five times a year if not more depending on the uh, topic. So through this uh, collection of meetings and interchange of specific documents that describe how we're going to physically connect electrically and mechanically the various components, we can coordinate our activity. Can we look forward to more collaborations between NASA and ISRO now? That's the plan. I think there's a lot of excitement as this mission goes forward that uh, we should be able to do that. This one is a very big mission actually. Uh, there have been previous collaborations between NASA and ISRO in the past, smaller than this. This one is the biggest, the most challenging so far and I think it will set the standard for future collaborations. On a broader level, how important do you think collaborations are between national space agencies? As the nature of the science that we need to do uh, becomes more complex, uh, as the 
sampling of the earth needs to be more frequent. I believe that the only way to solve some of the major science problems in the future related to climate and hazards is through collaboration amongst the agencies. That's my personal opinion. Uh, it seems to be a trend, in fact, amongst uh, major missions because the cost of large missions that have high sampling rates, high resolution, and large volumes of data, the cost is, is greater than most nations would uh, be willing to uh, fund for themselves. So they look to collaborations to share the cost and to share the data which is an important thing in, the, in today's world. Where do you see a role for the private industry in all this? Well, industry typically builds uh, components of the hardware in the United States. I'm not exactly sure, and uh, I can't speak for the Indian side. Uh, we have major contracts uh, for all aspects of our system. Uh, so that's how we engage industry. To, to be honest, I believe that the trend in the future for many missions is for industry to propose their own missions to the space agencies and uh, move forward. I think some industries are more mature than others, but uh, as time goes on, I suspect there will be a very strong component of, of uh, industry-initiated science and applications missions. Thank you for talking to GeoBiz.